We had left off last time at this point. We, I began to discuss it, but we clearly sort of ran out of time to do a reasonable job. So I want to return to it. Now, I want you also to remember that I, I talked about four logics that explain why we have global cities. Why in a time when we have extraordinarily digitized capabilities uh, or extraordinary digitized capabilities, there is this growing concentration of the richest sectors like high finance, which number one, could not exist without uh, digital space, and number two, are super rich and could buy or be wherever they, they could be, why they wind up concentrating in what has been over the last 20 years, expanding zones. I used the image of operational space. You know, it's like an operational space that installs itself in these cities, that includes all kinds of, uh, you know, specialized services, forms of knowledge, infrastructure, superstructures, you name it. And, and I just want you to keep alive this notion that we shouldn't just say, well, of course they would want to be in, uh, in, in New York, in London, in whatever, Paris, whatever. Not because just going beyond the people that do the jobs where they want to live, there is actually a necessity that is built into the sector. And that is different from the preferences of the rich, top level whatevers, you know, that they want to live in a big city. It goes much deeper than that. That is the point that I'm trying to make. Now, when, when I have said that, or when you have written that, uh, you then want to develop why. You still then have to answer the question, why? Because it's not about having a better life in a famous city. There's something else involved too. And it has to do with how these highly digitized and very rich and powerful, hence they really have choices, why they need to be in these concentrations. I began to develop that a bit and I said, one of the reasons, one of the big differences between being in a national economy and in a, versus a global economy, is that in the national economy, you have a certain kind of control over the whole uh, situation. And you are producing within a familiar zone. Uh, the, the economy, even if you looked at banking and you know, sort of complex sectors, it was pretty routinized. What happens when we globalize? is that you are dealing with a broad unknown, which are the 70 countries you might be working on, the whatever, you know, et cetera, et cetera. At that point, you become dependent. You, rich firm, rich corporation, become dependent on a whole range of specialized forms of knowledge. If you're working in 70 different countries, you will need to understand 70 different modes in which they do accounting, in what are the preferences for investment in all of those different countries. You can no longer hire all those people in-house, full-time. You don't need them. You might need 15 hours of that, 13 hours of that, 25 hours of that, 150 hours of that, and you're dealing with 70 countries, 100 countries, or 30 countries, or whatever. So I want you to make sure that you understand those basic logics, because they mark a difference with that earlier period. And of course, they carry significant consequences for cities. And I already alluded to something in earlier sessions. You know, there actually has been an extraordinary large grab of central city land in most major cities in the world to install these complex operations where you have expertise about all kinds of things for all kinds of countries. That takes space. And again, there is an irony in that, that all these digitized capabilities, and finance is ultimately digital in many ways, right? That they still need all of those materialities to the point that they occupy more and more space. If you add to that the living the living of their lives, in other words, the households, the homes where they are, that occupies even more space. So they begin to, as, as we know, there's quite a bit of evidence, displace 
older middle classes, you know, that were rich but not super rich, and they begin to displace modest, modest uh, people who can no longer afford to live there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are major trends that are happening in a lot of these cities. Now, so the second logic that I began to talk about but I couldn't finish is this notion that the global economy is not a given. It is not somehow, oh my God, an inevitable condition. There it is. Like, it rains. No. It was made. It was made in multiple ways. Changing legal systems to open the borders, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. bringing in extraordinary innovations. When, when the digital revolution starts, finance was, uh, in this, we're talking now the late 1970s, early 1980s, finance was a critical actor in shaping the innovations. They knew what they wanted. And we tend to, you know, the attention went to other issues. People, a lot of the commentators on the digital didn't even pick up on finance. I remember being, for instance, at sort of big meetings because the whole question of the digital was like a revolution, you know. And so I remember very well this one event. I went to something called Ars Electronica. I don't know if any of you know that. Does any of you know that Ars Electronica? It's a fantastic festival that happens every two years, I think. Anyhow, it's huge, you know, people from all over, etc. cetera. And, and, um, and so I was asked to give a talk, and there were uh, two professors from, from, uh, from MIT who were inventors of a lot of this technology, right? And they had a very positive image. They were almost romantic about, but because this was a mode, you may remember that, what all could be done with these digital technologies. And I, this was like in the early 1980s we're talking, this event, and I had been looking at finance and, and you know, and some of these issues that I've already alluded to. And so I, I was not as romantic as these two very big men were who were truly romantic. There was something very nice about that, you know, about the technology, it's so good, it makes all the difference. And so I remember coming in and saying, you know, let's talk about some of the negatives. And that was almost like, like, like violating some secret role, rule about this is all fantastic, all of this innovation. And a lot of people in the audience applauded because they had experienced not the scientist moment of discovery, but the limitations or the problematics or the knowledge vector that, everything, that, that their bosses knew everything about them, whatever, who were working in that domain. This to me was extraordinarily informative, you know, that we started out in much of the West with a truly romanticized notion and understanding of these technologies. By the way, I love them. I can't imagine my life without eh, the digital. But the fact that I, who was looking at a very powerful sector that had its own interests, was also picking up on how it aggregated, if you want, power, eh? and, and sort of the problems that come with that. Now, so the global economy is not a given. It was made. It was made by certain actors who gained a lot from it, and it killed other economic actors, which maybe were doomed to die, you know, but forms of the economy that simply no longer worked. Now, let's look at these two propositions. I already developed them a bit last class, but I just want to make sure that, that it's clear. So the global economy is not merely a function of the power. Now, this is a term that is no longer used very much. The transnational corporations, TNCs, you know, these big international firms, which were really slow-moving animals, sort of huge firms. They were not a revolutionary firm, as you were seeing with the emergent, uh, you know, th these new technologies. It was a very different world. But I repeat, the global economy is not merely a function of the power of these huge firms that at that time, in the 1980s, dominated the global economy. They were the international actors. They were the avant-garde. And they were, you know, totally different from today's, I would say. The global economy, second point, is made constructed. It needs to be organized, designed, serviced. It is not 
simply a given. So the global economy with which we live today is one instantiation of a whole mix of conditions, capabilities, new discoveries, innovations, etc., etc. It could have gone differently. You know, maybe there are the core issues that are very difficult to imagine them differently, but it took a certain shape. The same thing with the rise of finance, which, as I said, is very different from traditional banking. Okay? So, uh, as I like to say, traditional banking sells something it has. We all need that bank moment in our lives. Sooner or later, we need a bank, no matter what. Finance is different. So finance, I repeat, sells something it does not have. And in selling what it does not have lies its absolutely brilliant innovations because it has to get, it is going to get what it wants. And for that it has to innovate. So when finance arises, it is an absolute, or rises, it's an absolutely different formation from the traditional bank, even though they call themselves banks. So I just want to add that dimension. Now, moving on here. So, so now let, let's just move into these two paragraphs just to get a sense of, and the image here is, the digital has emerged, uh, laws have been changed, possibilities have been offered, we have global firms that are moving around, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so in that, against that background, this then. So global dispersal, right? You're operating in many different countries, etc. along with simultaneous system integration. If you're a big firm that wants to operate globally, you don't just want to be everywhere, you also want system, you know, you, you want to, to run a whole operation. So system integration raises the complexity and importance of central functions because to a large extent, global trade is intra-firm and hence managed. But second point, financial markets are increasingly becoming corporate owned. Did you follow that? Do you understand that? Okay, so let's go. So global dispersal, simultaneous integration, I, I repeat, you are a global firm, you don't just want to operate everywhere, you also want to have a certain kind of control over the whole thing, and you want to extract and that, that what you extract goes to where you want it to go. So you want to have a managed global operation. This is not, you know, sort of a free for all. Now, to a large extent, global, this, is, this is a feature. So a lot of what is measured as the global economy still today is trade. Most of that trade is trade inside a firm that is cited, that is located in many different countries. So we might call that international trade, but it's actually happening inside a firm. Is that clear or not? Like think of any firm that has a lot of, you know, Amazon or whatever, Google, I mean, they may be located, I don't know in how many different countries, but there is also an overarching control and extraction of, you know, whatever the, the gains, if you want. Now, the fact that we have made a lot about global trade in, in the last 20 years. Global trade matters for countries, it matters for little firms, et cetera, et cetera, all true. It is absolutely shocking to what extent global trade is dominated by a limited number of firms. This is not so great. So one of the things that has happened, they enter into, say, poorish countries in Africa, that are operating with local firms, and then they basically wipe out the small local firms and make franchises. So they set up a local franchise of the big international firm. When you have a franchise, now listen to this carefully, when you have a franchise, many franchises in localities, inevitably, part of whatever the franchise is making in terms of profits, does not stay in the country or in the city where it's happening. It goes to central headquarters. So if you have foreign firms in your country, it may well wind up in a headquarters, a lot of it, part of it, that is in a foreign country. You understand what I'm saying, right? So that kind of global, what they call international trade, 
It's often called international trade, global trade, but it's actually within a firm. This is very important. So, so there is a kind of weird internationalism because these firms are operating in all of these, these different countries and cities, but actually it is also a, a limited number of huge firms that command a very large share of all that we call the global economy. And so, yes, it's international, but you know what? It's also a few nationalities that control. So it's sort of an ambiguous animal. I, I hope you are, you are understanding a bit. Now, financial markets. So we started out in an older epoch, you know, Wall Street, think the old days of Wall Street. Those were interesting spaces. You had, say, in, uh, in Chicago, where you had these huge... Uh, uh, operations to raise pigs. Chicago, lots, lots of pigs and stuff like that. And they would actually trade. You know, let, let me backtrack. If you have six pigs, this is true, I'm talking pig, yeah, the animal, okay? If you have six pigs, you get to know your pigs. You can set the price. These are great pigs. That one is not so good, lower price. If you raise Two million pigs? You can't get to know all your pigs. You just can't. So what do you do? And you want to sell it, right? It's about selling. So you set a price for a future shape that that pig is going to have. And this is what happened. And so out of that comes a derivative. You know, all these financial instruments, they often have these very material histories. Now. We didn't raise pigs in London, in New York. I already mentioned to you that each financial center is a bit differently. That is also a very important part of the story here that is often overlooked. Now back to this, um, when the financial markets move into financializing, you know, iron, pigs, uh, food crops, whatever, they create a whole other operational space. Are you still with me or not? Or is this a bit abstract? I hope you're... I just want you to understand how finance works. So finance has a capacity to financialize three million pigs into an instrument that you can buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell several times in a day, unlike the actual pig, but you cannot. So there are two layers, well, three layers. The real stuff, the pigs, the corn, the metal, the commodity, and then the financialized asset, or asset-backed security, or whatever it is. So today, way, way back when, we only had this level. And then we had the commodity, because three million pigs, you can't get to know them individually, so you set a price. And then we moved yet another step, and we made a financialized product. I think I mentioned to you that many of those empty buildings in New York you know the big new fancy towers that have been built that are quite empty? You know what I'm talking about? So many people think, oh, poor buyers. Those towers are sitting basically empty. They're, they're apartment, fancy apartment buildings. Well, my first question is, are they actually also functioning as asset-backed securities? that are based on those buildings. For many owners, of an, an owner is typically a corporation, that building, uh, the fact that it's empty, might mean that it's making much more money for them than if they were renting or selling the units. Do you understand? If you don't understand the, the, the how they do it, that's one thing, but I want you to understand the economic logic that is involved in that. What it means for cities, I'm going to return to this subject, this is a big issue, is that you can have a lot of beautiful buildings that are empty and pretty dark at night, which is not good for a city. That de-urbanizes, huh? that's not good, that is a form of death. But at the same time, the people who own those buildings are making much more money than if they were renting them out to people. That's bad. You, you can see what that does right to urban space. Now back to this. So when financial markets are increasingly not the stock market as we have known it, but the kinds of markets that we see now, 
where you also have privately owned networks that are account for up to 70% of trading. You have a very weird situation. And finance, I want you to again remember this, finance has the capacity to financialize everything. I think I met, no, I don't know if everything, but a lot. I think I mentioned to you already the student debt in this country. By the way, do people know what the student debt is like in this country? How much? It's over a trillion dollars. Now, it's a debt, okay? So the traditional bank would not know what to do with that trillion dollars. Finance knows what to do with it. A trillion dollars, debt, positive, doesn't matter. I can work with that because it's a concentrated arrangement of sorts. So this just gives you, what I'm trying to convey to you is that once high finance enters the picture, it begins to alter a whole set of physical conditions that we interpret in, 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 in a certain way but they're actually doing very fine, those empty luxury towers, because they are being bought and sold, bought and sold in the financial circuit as asset-backed securities or whatever. And the other thing is that debt, debt, as long as it's there, a trillion, you, you need a good amount. Trillion, I can work with that, and they do. So this is a very weird sector in some ways when it comes to cities in terms of its impact. The other aspect is why do these firms that have these brilliant minds, these brilliant instruments, these, you know, this capacity to be global, etc., why do they need to be concentrated in cities? And, and of course, these, these firms are concentrated in multiple financial centers, okay? It's not just New York. And here you enter the issue of the complexity of the sector. You need, I mentioned last time, I said, you know, if you're operating globally, you need a few specialized hours of this expertise, that different countries and different segments within countries. That explains partly why you have this agglomeration. And remember, the big agglomerators are the financial firms. They need to be, you know, in these concentrations they who deal with something that is immaterial. So it's that tension that I want you to sort of get a hold on. And, and, and you don't need to understand all the mechanics of it, but just to understand why finance concentrates this way and to what extent it is precisely a function because it is so digitized. In other words, speed becomes essential, knowledge becomes essential. Now, now that we have the hypercomputers, I don't know if people know, I assume some of you know this. Now that we have these hypercomputers that are trading by themselves, even distance reemerges. So in Hong Kong, they have a huge, uh, how do you call that, a huge storage space which has all these hypercomputers right next to the financial center. In New York, in Manhattan, do you know where the big computers are being stored? Because you want them as close by as you can. Because suddenly, with hyperfrequency trading, distance reemerges, physical distance, which you know we had eliminated for the last 20 years. Do people know where it is here in the case of the, low, the Wall Street? Where does Wall Street have all those machines that are doing the stuff, you know, the hyper, the hyper sort of hypercomputers? Right across the water, lo lower Manhattan, right across the water in New Jersey because that is little distance. So you understand we have gone from, and that explains, just to finish the thought, that explains why physical concentration actually can re-emerge in some sectors. Now the fact that it is in that sector, which is the richest, the most digitized, et cetera, et cetera, that has extraordinary tools, extraordinary minds, is an interesting fact. And these are counterintuitive things that I told you, two things. One is what I just said, and the other one is that those empty buildings might be producing more profits than if they were rented or bought by others. Those are counterintuitive. We, we are not quite seeing that well. Yes, of course. 
So that tells you something about a sector that, you know, and as I said, it has nothing to do with microeconomics. It has to do with, uh, with you know, algorithmic mathematics. It's physics. Yeah, that you know, right? So I just, you don't need to know all the details, but I want you to understand why the richest sectors are producing these vast concentrations of buildings in major cities. They're taking over urban land. The policemen, the nurses, the firemen, out, out, out. The modest middle class is out, to the edges, to the edges. And you would have thought, and that is what was exactly the main argument that was being made 20 years ago, once they're digitized and they're rich, they can buy whatever tech, they can locate anywhere. And instead what we have is like a string of massive concentrations that are the financial centers in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in, um, and in a city like Frankfurt, by the way, which is not a very big city, they have a sort of nodes that are also outside the city. But you need this concentration. So this is in many ways profoundly counterintuitive. You know, it goes against what we might expect. But then it becomes a profoundly urban condition momentarily, because these are global networks that also operate in some sort of digital zone. Now, I, I just, um, this is all basically, this little paragraph tells you in a few words what I just spent, I don't know, an hour and a half talking about, huh? but, but uh, I, hope, I hope that that critical element is in your brains, and supposedly, you know, once you get it, you just don't forget it. One of those things, you know that one and one is two. You know, you don't forget that. I wish this could be the same. It might not, but anyhow. Now, the other thing is now coming to the digital, which is a critical infrastructure. And as you know, in our cities, the digital, you know, in big cities, I don't know how they could do without these digital capabilities. But so designed, this is very important, Digital technology in many ways has as one sort of great moment the notion that it can shrink distance, neutralize distance. You can be there, I can be here, we can connect like that. Right? That is a critical feature. The engineers, the brilliant minds, that was one of the critical elements in that, right? So designed for long distance. Now, when it here I have to make a distinction. I don't know how much time I'm going to spend on this. But when you have cable, fiber optic cable, finance uses fiber optic cable. Do you know why? Because the satellites are accessible, maybe, etc. Fiber optic is safe, and you can move an extraordinary amount. Here is a second little irony. See if you can. So to maximize what you can extract from a fiber optic cable, you need a bit of length. It literally needs distance to deliver the most and to deliver the fastest. So what you don't want to do is cut it up. In many of our cities, when they bring fiber optic, like in your average neighborhood, what they do is they are cutting it off. And in doing that, having short little distances from one house to, or from one node to the other, You've lost the velocity. You've just lost it. So what finance has is vast, vast infrastructures that are basically these cables, which, by the way, you all know the stories, right? That because they had to locate them at the bottom of oceans, so they were bitten into, you know, by, by, by whatever sharks. I don't know what it would be. You know, there were all kinds of little crises. Now it's all very well done, you know, et cetera. But there are only about evidently four or five firms in the world who can put those cables down there. So this is a very, in many ways, rarefied world of extraordinary capacities, great intelligences, et cetera, et cetera. I always say one wishes it were put, you know, to better objectives than just accumulating extraordinary wealth. So let's go back to this. So in many ways, this, this, uh, this sort of, um, uh, technology is designed for long distance communications capable of neutralizing distance, space, time, compression, etc. Yet the most advanced infrastructures servicing leading sectors, 
such as finance, have a geography marked by long spans and dense nodes with massive concentrations of infrastructure and various technical features, right? To maximize the benefits firms and markets can derive from these technologies, they need organizational complexity. Now, this is another, this is the most difficult part of, of, of anything that I will be talking about, okay? These, this stuff that I've been talking about now, about finance, about et cetera, et cetera. So, here's an irony. They need, if you want to maximize if you want to extract the most out of some of these technologies, digital technologies, uh, organizational complexity is quite important. And I want to show you, just give a very simple example that sort of gets at that. So the same fiber optic cable put under a public library that is in contact with other libraries around the world, beautiful, great, you know, fantastic. You can access any book in any library, you know, in two minutes or maybe it's five. That is a very simple use of that technology. A financial center, 100% of extracting of all the features that you can get out of it, plus it pushes development. So one thing is the technology. Another thing is the operational actors that use it. Most of the time what we do, it's like very low level in terms of extracting all the capabilities that that technology offers you. <coughs> Finance is like a master at this. One question that I often have is why don't say municipal governments also raise the level of intelligence in terms of using those technologies. And I think I mentioned it already once here. My image is always that the municipal government should um, have a good team of people, right? And decide among themselves, what are the problems that we face? And how can we address them? What are the really difficult problems we have that we can't quite get a handle on because they happen in all the neighborhoods and how do we manage that? And then invite the tech firms that are always trying to sell products and ask the tech firms. Usually, let me backtrack, usually the model is that the, 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 the tech firms knock on the door of municipal governments and tell them, look, this is our latest thing, buy it, buy it, it's great. It will solve your problems. And then it typically doesn't. So I say turn it around. Have the leadership of cities understand what do we need, actually? What is it that we need? What are some of the problems that we have? How do we control, to give a very simple example, the fact that water might be leaking in some of these places, et cetera, et cetera. So decide what are the challenges you face as a government, then you invite the tech firms to come, and you tell them, can you help us with this problem? And there are many problems that a city has. You understand what I'm saying, right? And just to give you a very, very simple example, some of you must be familiar with the, the um, how do you call it when a hole happens in the street? How do you call that? A sink, no, no, a sinkhole, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean a, a pothole, pothole. So Boston, you all know, I assume everybody knows it by now, but everybody should because it's a beautiful little example. So Boston, the, the municipal, Boston is a place that has quite a bit of snow. And so potholes happen and all of that. Now, imagine you're a municipal government, you need to find out where all the potholes are. It's a hellish task. There are so many streets, there are so many, how are you going to find out? No, so you just covered that street yesterday and that the next day a pothole appears. I mean, it's, a, it's an unmanageable proposition. What did the municipal government under that mayor that they had, which was sort of a, almost a, a a caricature of sort of an Italian uncle, you know, sort of very, uh, he was just great. Um, so he decided to give every resident of Boston a little app that for free they put on their phones, and when they see or hit a pothole, they just click on the app, and the municipal government of Boston knows where the potholes are. You understand what I'm talking about, right? That is a, do you understand that part or not? Yes, okay. 
And that is the way thinking about all of this stuff from the perspective of a city. And there are many, many uh, such possibilities. I already mentioned that the city of Paris, for instance, is extraordinarily well run. They have a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay, so some of the stuff that I've been talking about till now here is also a way of explaining why to the most digitized, the richest, and the most globalized sectors in the world, a certain type of city becomes a crucial space. So I have, whether you have understood that or not, I have explained to you why. Because the count, this is a counterintuitive outcome, as we say. Because the normal thing would have been that rich firms can locate wherever, given these technologies, and given that they can buy those technologies. And when it comes to a sector like finance, whatever is routinized can go wherever. But what is sort of in the vortex of innovations and grabbing opportunities cannot. So I really, that is to me an extraordinarily important point to understand, which when these technologies set in, the financial sector can really go global. It can do extraordinary things. I mean, when I say extraordinary, I just mean the technology because you know I don't like the whole money side of it, but that's another subject. We don't need to go there. But, but the fact is that concentration, and a concentration that is made up of the mixity of talents and forms of knowledge is what maximizes the benefits that these firms, these types of firms can extract from these technologies. Whereas, as I said, the public library, fantastic, you know, connected to the whole world, but it's very elementary. Whereas for a sector like finance, a few other sectors, but finance is the most extreme case, I would say, when it comes to these kinds of, I mean, there are certain parts of university research that also require it, but that's different. Um, and, and this is another important point. So the global city function, one at the core element, not just one, not the only one, but one, and certainly at the beginning, is this notion that it's not about headquarters so much. It really is about networked, so what you have, networked service firms, specialized knowledges, et cetera, et cetera. So what you have is a multiplicity of extraordinarily specialized state-of-the-art firms that can supply this type of accounting, that type of et cetera, et cetera. And the headquarters of some more traditional, you know, they, they buy some of that stuff too, they can also benefit. But what drives it is this continuous innovation that you see in high finance. Now, I also think that finance has cycles. Huh? So right now, we don't know what is next. But you know, no matter how well the stock market is doing, it is a bit in trouble. Huh? There, there is some stasis building in there. And I'm sort of curious to see what is the next leg, but we'll find out probably soon enough. Um, so, so point, I repeat, some of the most specialized, advanced, riches that could buy whatever technology you can use to do it from anywhere in the world are the ones that are producing these vast concentrations of big powerful firms that are displacing other elements in our cities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is counterintuitive given a lot of the arguments that dominate the explanation of digital technologies. So just, just work on that, okay? You can, I know that you can do it, but you may have to write a bit more than the two sentences that I just gave you, okay? I hope you understand that too. So read a bit. Anyhow, so now here are some, these are older maps because these are beginnings and it shows you how the networks, so this is cable, you know, et cetera, uh, how, the, how they don't go everywhere. You know, it's not a diffuse, it's very marked. There are very particular geographies to what is connected, et cetera. I mean, you can see that the east-west vector, you know, in certain, uh, it, it's quite, here's, you know, again, these are older maps. You know, you have very particular configurations for this infrastructure that is actually servicing. 
Now, what we have in cities are cut up, you know, little thingies that move more slowly. You know, we have our own needs and, you know, the general population. And here's another one where you see it very clearly. Now, uh, it's also interesting to know that I, I mentioned it, uh, I think, already, but there are very few firms in the world that have the capacity to do these underground cables. And, and when you read some of the accounts at the beginnings, huh, when they were doing that, I mean, they, you understand they had to cut across countries that were at war with each other, oceans, etc. I mean, it's an extraordinary. I've long thought that somebody should write a dissertation huh, about what it took to lay, as they, the phrase that was used often was lay cable, had put cable down. And of course, at the beginning, as I said, often there were fish that bit through it, etc. And so now it goes under. There are very few firms in the world, and the French firms are among them, that have this capacity. So it's a very rarefied zone of knowledge and capability. It's absolutely, in its practice, global. You know, it cuts across. And it's a major challenge. It's absolutely a major challenge. Now, final point here. Again, the logic that explains this peculiar agglomeration format that we have at a time of the digital, etc. And so information, which is a big word also in the current culture, information in an information economy. This is what we're talking about, right? Information economy in the sense of the sectors that are more digital, etc and include finance in there. Different types and spatial consequences. So standardized information. I mean, you can get that anywhere. The public library. You know, it, it doesn't matter. That, that here is not. Now, if you come back to, to these, these very sort of uh, innovative firms that are financial firms, you know, they have particular uh, routinized information needs as well. That is one part of the picture. That's sort of, you know, that is the most common part, etc. cetera. Uh, when it begins to change is when you have a higher order of information that is not just a datum. So the military took over blah, blah in this country. The, not that kind of thing, but a mix of elements coming together that allow you to say, wow, something is going to happen here. It could be good or bad. Right, so think now again, financiers who are figuring out is that company going to get here and buy that one, et cetera, are the value is going to go. What, sort of very complicated mixtures of elements. You don't know what, need to know what they are, but they are mixtures of elements. So kind of, kind of a higher order information, a mix of guesses, evaluations, you know, interpretations, blah, blah, that, that A there, and B, that is critical for the most complex and strategic activities of firms and markets. Now, what I want you to, I want you to situate all of this in a, in a very particular working space. And high finance, again, is the, is the extreme. Extraordinary acceleration of transactions, fast, fast, fast. Enormous variety. I mean, thousands of options. And everything has to go very quickly. Things go up, down, up, down. One day they're good, one day they're So what you have, you're dealing with a vortex of conditions. And the, 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 the technology itself makes it even worse because everything is sped up and you have access to everything. And every major bank has access to a lot of stuff. So this is no... You know, so when we talk about information, yes, there is information that is standardized. You know, the insurance companies, the big insurance companies, they have standardized information that can be complex, but you can get it anywhere, it moves slowly, blah, blah. And then there is another kind of information. And so, and that is something that really the current digital period enables a kind of information that, you know, 30 years ago we didn't have which is a continuously transforming vortex of decisions, et cetera. You have to deal with that, and you can go crazy. That is why, as I mentioned, you know, these, these financial firms, they, they have huge 
uh, numbers of physicists working for them who can sort of begin to sort it out. They see patterns, etc., of these very complex things. Now, I always wonder, you know, there is a lot of intelligence in this sector, and one just wishes that they could move on to other types of projects. Um, so the Global City is, strategic site, is a strategic site where multiple global, highly specialized, partial information, everything is partial. It's either partial because it's going to change the next two hours or the next two days, or it's partial because you can't quite have an oversight over all the information you need. Huh? So special partial information loops intersect and produce a dense, thick, enabling environment for the production of these higher forms of knowledge. One of the reasons that so many top financial firms that are super rich are still located in central cities is because in that central city, directly or indirectly, by chance or by design, they get to know a vast mix of bits of knowledge. So this is a very peculiar and extreme formation that feeds into a set of consequences that are not so great for cities. You know? And again, that is why that image that I want you to have is a vast operational space with multiple very different elements. It sort of installs itself in these cities. Now, I want you, I'm just wondering, I want to ask you a question. Who of you knows, for instance, that the city of London, you know, which is a financial center, has an invisible Di a digital wall around it so that if you park and you don't and you leave your car there overnight they'll pick up on it they won't pick up the car but they'll pick up on it they might also pick up the car but that's another matter so who 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 knows that very good so most of you don't there is, the digital is a very complex zone when you're dealing with complex sectors. And it is deployed in ways that most of us just <coughs> never intersect with. We just don't. So this digital in this world is, is a, a special kind of thing. So there is no perfect global city. This is extremely important. And I want to show you, we're going to skip. Uh, now here, here's one element, a global firm does not want one perfect global city. They want many. That is also part of the feature of today. So a lot of the firms that are headquartered in Manhattan also have firms elsewhere. The notion again of the digital, the digital interpretation was that since you can connect with everything digitally, you just need to have your firm in one place. It turns out that if you look at the 100 top specialized service firms, which can be accounting, lawyering, you know, that kind of stuff that are servicing other firms, they have over 600 branches across the world. That is many countries also. So this is, is something that was completely misunderstood by people. So there is an extraordinary shadow effect that some of these very complex sectors have over all kinds of places. Now, the fact that you have a particular operation set up in some city somewhere a bit remotely does not necessarily make that city a global city, okay? The global city is truly a complex mixture of functions. Uh, now, here I want to show you, this is one of the best, most detailed studies that has been done. There are many very bad studies. I do not recommend them. Um, and and this looks at the top 100 cities in terms of all kinds of variables. Huh? So I'm just going to give you just a few elements so you get a picture. So overall ranking, the top score is 100. So the title for me, the indirect title is, there is no perfect global city. So the top cities, London, New York, Tokyo, 79, 72, 66. If you got that as a grade and the top grade is 100, you would not be happy, right? So that is not a good score. Now, going on, so none of the leading cities in the world ranks at the top. 
they are all imperfect, which is frankly how it should be. A city should not be perfect. That, that, that just doesn't work. Now, here, ease of doing business. Now, we have all read a lot, heard a lot from mayors, from politicians, from business people. Make it easy for firms, you know, be nice, don't make such a, then they'll, et cetera. You know, there's a whole sort of zone of, here are some of the issues. So, <laughs> London is number three, not number one. New York, number five. Singapore and Hong Kong are at the top. You know? And so if you go also down, um, sometimes it gets quite entertaining. Uh, now, in the global south, you have these, in, these very significant global cities, I would say. So Mumbai and Sao Paulo are in the top group. Though that might have changed now with, with, uh, with the Brazilian case, eh, with Sao Paulo, for financial and economic services but are brought down uh, in their overall score by their low rankings in factors related to the ease of doing business and livability, given their especially low level of well-being for vast sectors. So that has a drag effect. That is something that has also been quite well established, that this operational space is so vast and it wants to function well, etc. However, uh, Financial dimension, you know, financial services network, total value of equity trading. There, London and New York are high. Frankfurt, small city, very high, etc. And then you see more. I mean, there are a hundred cities that are listed. Business center dimension, blah blah. Hong Kong, Singapore. Hong Kong and Singapore are continuously appearing at the top. Um, and New York is number eight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Knowledge creation and information flows, London, number one, Paris, Tokyo, Paris. So you can see when you look at the full list, you see that it is sort of a, a map that shows you all these enclaves that are these massive combinations of knowledges and capabilities and ambitions and I don't know what. Overall ranking, okay, we already did that. Um, I thought I, I had something that... No, there was, one, there was one that showed, no, this is other stuff. Okay, uh, there was one slide that I, I don't have here um, that shows when it comes to ease of doing business that both New York and London rank very low. They absolutely do not do well. Now that might be that they are so full of themselves, you know what I mean? that why should we bother? But I think that is an interesting datum. Okay, people, I think I'm done with this. I can only hope uh, that you got a bit of it. You better do. And have a nice dinner, huh? have a nice dinner. <laughs>